Uh, we are very honored to have with us today Guy Standing, Professorial Research Associate at SOAS University of London and former Program Director at the ILO and also author of The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class. And with the elections we've had in Europe, I think it's very appropriate. So I'd like to uh, welcome Guy on stage, who is going to speak to us about why we need a new approach to work to liberate precariats. Welcome, Guy Standing. <clears throat> Thank you very much. As I was sitting there, looking at you, I was wondering what possible value added I could give to your General Assembly today. And I can see that a few people are, are leaving to go for a coffee. So I will try to, to give a contextual introduction. Because I think what you are trying to do in SMART and what cooperatives are trying to do is give a structural response to the contextual crisis that we're facing. And I want to concentrate on the features of this crisis because we're in the middle of a global transformation, the painful construction of a global market system. And it's very analogous to Karl Polanyi's great transformation, where we've been going through the first phase, which was dominated very strongly by American Chicago-based economics, which we now call neoliberalism. And neoliberalism has involved not only privatization and commodification of our societies, but a dismantling of all the old institutions of social solidarity and society itself. Margaret Thatcher famously said, there is no such thing as society. There are only individuals and families. And in a sense, the neoliberal project has been about realizing that sentiment, that emotion. Now we're in the stage where neoliberalism has not only created globalization and accelerated the technological revolution that is affecting all of our lives, but has achieved something that no one had anticipated and which is really a fundamental feature of the challenge we have today. And that is that the 20th century income distribution system has broken down. Fundamentally, for about 50 years in the middle decades of the 20th century, the share of national income, be it in Belgium, France, Britain, United States, anywhere else, the share of national income going to capital and the share going to labor were approximately stable. It was a sharing system, a form of consensus. But since the onset of neoliberalism in the 1980s, what we've seen in every part of the world, including most of all China, is the share going to capital has gone up and the share going to labor has gone down. So in a sense, everybody who's relying on work and labor has been suffering a loss of the share. And as the pie has grown larger, as it were, what has happened, in fact, is that a larger and larger proportion of total income is going in rent the returns to property, the returns to the ownership of assets, financial assets, physical assets, and most of all, intellectual property as assets. And this means that the actual structure of income has been profoundly affected. And what I'm about to talk about is one of the outcomes 
of this structural change in the income distribution system. Because if the share going to labor is going down, then we should not be surprised, which is exactly what has happened, that real wages have been declining or it's stagnant at best across the industrialized OECD world. It's a reality. And we have to realize, too, that there is no prospect, no realistic prospect, that that pattern will be reversed. You will occasionally see real wages rise a little and then decline a little, but fundamentally, this structural change means that more and more of the income is going to the rentiers, the property owners. It's a reality. Now, in that context, what we've seen is with globalization, all of us as workers are competing in a globalized labor pool where the supply of labor into the open market has quadrupled. Four times as many people are now part of the global labor market as was the case 30 years ago. An extra two billion people are part of a globalizing labor market. That's a fundamental shift, a fundamental change that gives us a totally different context because all of those two billion people who have become part and are becoming part of the global labor market are habituated to a living standard which is one thirtieth or one fortieth of what a typical Belgian or typical British person could expect. So the downward pressure from that itself is going to continue for a long time. As the wages in China and India gradually go up, ours will continue to go down. It's a reality of economics that we cannot avoid. At the same time, we are seeing that a new class structure has been taking shape. My Marxist friends have been very angry with me. I have many scars because I'm talking about a new class structure when for them there are only two classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. That is ridiculous. I'm sorry. I may have scars from their attacks, but I profoundly disagree with that conceptualization of our reality today. And what has happened since the pursuit of flexible labor markets and the whole neoliberal project is that we've had a class fragmentation which has become clearer and clearer. And when I first started to write about in this in the 1990s, people said, well, th th this doesn't make sense, but now, Every single day, every day, I receive emails or messages from people who say they belong to the growing mass class. What is that? Well, let's start by thinking of what's happened at the top of our income spectrum. We have a plutocracy. It's not the top 1%. It's not the top half a percent, it's the top 0.1% of multi-billionaires who are the ultimate rentiers. They are global citizens, they're taking more and more rental income from positions of power. They've offered the stratosphere. They have a man in the White House who is the epitome of the representative of the plutocracy. They are creating plutocratic institutions, plutocratic fiscal policy, plutocratic democracy, in which we, as citizens, are almost reduced to being fodder, almost reduced to being commodified respondents to their dominant discourse. It won't continue for long, but we are in a dark tunnel at the moment with the plutocrats ruling the world. Underneath the plutocrats is an elite of multimillionaires, 
people who are taking a lot of their income from rent, serving the interests of the plutocracy, and they are doing very well too. Underneath them in the income spectrum is what I call the salariat. It's difficult for French audience, but the salariat is a play on the proletariat, but they are salariat in the sense that they have employment security, they have occupational pensions, they have all the trappings of the laborist welfare states that were built up in the post-1945 era. The salariat, when I was a student at Cambridge, we were basically taught that by the end of the 20th century, almost everybody would be part of what I call the salariat, with employment security, pensions, paid leave, paid maternity leave, paid, paid this, paid that, and everything. And for a long time, that was a growing group. But now, everywhere, the salariat is shrinking, and I get a lot of people coming to my talks of a certain generation, and they come up at the end and said, can I buy a copy of your book? And I said, yeah. And they said, I want it for my daughter, to give to my daughter or my son, because they're going to be entering the precariat. Now, the salariat are detached from the old social security system because they've got private pensions, private this, private that, etc. So they aren't defenders of the welfare state, nor of the elite, nor of the plutocrats. And below the salariat, in terms of income, are a lot of you in this room. You are what I've called in my precariat books proficients. So you call them freelancers, but I've never understood why freelance is, quite, is not quite right in the English language. But proficients is a combination of professionals and technicians. People who have professional skills, but don't belong to the salariat or the proletariat. You have ambitions to be independent, but you have needs to belong to institutions of solidarity, because otherwise you're going to fall into the growing mass class. Now, the proficients are, I hope, a harbinger of the future, because many people want that sense of independence, want that sense of creativity, the Renaissance, Enlightenment values of being a free spirit in control. But not many people are fortunate to be full proficients. Below the proficients in the class structure is the old proletariat. And the old proletariat is the group that the ILO was established to protect in 1919. The proletariat, briefly, can be described as those having full-time, stable labor, jobs. Full-time jobs, <laughs> lasting 30 years. And at the end of it, if you're really fortunate, the boss will give you a watch <laughs> or something that you've already got. <laughs> now, the Proletariat, of course, was the group for which the labor unions were established, a group for collective bargaining, labor law, labor regulations, all those ILO conventions that I had to read and study when I was in the International Labor Organization, all 200-odd of them, dictating what has to be done, not done, da-da-da-da-da-da-da but it protected a shrinking number of people in industrial stable jobs and in services, in public services. Today, the proletariat is shrinking in every part of the world. I work a lot in India, where industrialization has been very rapid, but the proletariat has not been growing. The same in China, the same all over the world. And it's below the proletariat that this new mass class 
is emerging. And that's the precariat. And the precariat is also a class that some of you in this room will belong to or will fear belonging to. You can define the precariat in three dimensions. The first dimension is that they have distinctive relations of production. They are being habituated and told that they must put up with a life of unstable, insecure labor. Fluctuating employment, fluctuating and casual, and even if they stay in jobs for years, they still have the fear that any time it could end. This group is not only having unstable labor, but they have something which is very distinctive in that they have no occupational narrative to give to their lives. No sense that through their work and labor, they are becoming something. Through their work and labor, they have a narrative that they can tell their children or their friends or their relatives, I am, or I am becoming, or in retirement, I was. That's a feature of the precariat everywhere. They also have no corporate narrative in a sense of belonging to an organization or a corporation. Even if you feel in smart that you are creating a community, more and more people are not feeling they belong to a corporate entity. It is also the first class in history where the level of education, on average, is above the level of labor they can expect to perform. That creates a status frustration, a sense of existential denial. And it's particularly important because another feature of the precariat is that more and more work is done off workplaces, outside labor time. It's work that is not recognized in our statistics as work. One of the ironies of the technological revolution is that in actual fact, contrary to common claims, automation is leading to a new phenomenon of heteromation, where more and more people are having to do more and more work outside recognized statistical labor. And if you don't do that work, you pay a heavy price because you, can't, you don't keep up. You don't keep up with your colleagues. You don't keep up with the technology. You don't keep up. And so this creates a, a stress, a stress because you feel you can only fail. If you're in the precariat, this is a phenomenon which thousands of people have written to me about. However hard you work, you feel you're close to failing. So work more and you still feel close to failing. This is a feature of the relations of production. And there is a phenomenon which I've called the precariatized mind. If you're in the precariat, you don't know often how much time I should give to this activity? How much time should I give to that activity? How much time should I give to networking? How much time should I give to retraining because my last lot of tools have gone out of date? Right? If you're in the precariat, you have this constant stress of not knowing how to allocate your time. And this leads to a loss of what psychologists call a mental bandwidth a shrinking capacity to actually be rational. And if you're in the lower rungs of the precariat, you suffer that big time. The second distinctive aspect of the precariat is that you have distinctive relations of distribution. What that means is, fundamentally, 
that you are having to rely almost entirely on money wages. You don't get the trappings of the laborist welfare state. You don't get paid holidays or paid maternity leave or whatever it might be. You are losing those rights that we called social rights. And it's one of the reasons why the statistics on income distribution and statistics on income inequality are today misleading. Because sometimes the precariat has a raise in money wages, but they've lost four weeks of paid holiday. Or they've lost the occupational pension that their salariat colleagues could look forward to. That's a real diminishing amount of your remuneration. Now, in addition, not only are they losing non-wage benefits, but we have seen something which is the subject of my new book, which is about to come out, which is that the precariat have been losing the commons. The commons are part of our income. They are part of what we rely on as citizens. And if you're in the precariat, you have to rely on the commons more than any other group. You need the parks. You need the libraries. You need the amenities. They give you part of your income. And you don't have that. They've been taken away. They've been privatized. They've been neglected or whatever. And in addition, of course, if you're in the precariat, you are seeing the withering of the social state. You are seeing a situation in which government after government all over the world have turned away from any semblance of universalism, of rights-based social protection, to means testing and targeting on the poor. There's a famous statement by Richard Titmus, one of the early sociologists of the welfare state, who said that benefits that are only for the poor are always poor benefits. And it's very true because once you shift to targeting to help just the poor, you lose that sense of social solidarity in society where other groups want to defend the welfare system. And therefore, they can allow the, the value of the benefits to go down because they're not defended by the majority. And we have seen that shifting to means testing, whereby you have to say, well, how do we decide who's poor? We have to do a test. Test your income. If you introduce a means test, you then say, ah, but this man is only poor because he's lazy. Therefore, we have to introduce a behavior test to prove that he wasn't lazy in the past, he's not lazy now, and he won't be lazy in the future. So the state has become more and more of a panopticon system because surveillance and questionnaires and testing and stigmatization has gone with that. So we know that in all countries, more and more people who need and depend on benefits are going to be denied them or stigmatized, punished, or whatever it might be by the bureaucrats. This is the reality for the precariat. They know that. But in addition, you create, and we have created across Europe and everywhere else, huge poverty traps. Because if you only give it to the poor, that means if someone goes from being poor to non-poor, some system of deductions is going to remove the benefits, right? Obviously. And in country after country, what this means is that the marginal tax rate, in effect, is something like 80%. In Britain, it's over 80%. In other words, if you get $20 extra, 20 euros extra, or whatever it is, you're going to lose most of that money. No incentive to take a low-wage job, right? So that drives more people into the black system where they don't declare, they risk 
becoming criminals, or it leads them not to taking those jobs. And then they get accused of being lazy, etc. That is the system that we've allowed to grow up. And whether you're in Sweden where it's happening, or in Britain or anywhere else, it's a reality. And the politicians either don't know this reality, or more likely refuse to acknowledge it. So this second part of the definition of the precariat leads to one key point which is extremely important for the sort of social protection system I and Philippe and others would like to see in the future. Whereas the old welfare state dealt with contingency risks, risk of unemployment, risk of maternity, risk of an illness, risk of an accident, and could build an insurance system, today's insecurity that the precariat experiences is fundamentally uncertainty. Uncertainty. I don't know what's going to hit me at any time. It could be an event the other side of the world for which I have absolutely no responsibility, but it could hit me straight away. And that sense of uncertainty you can't insure against. You can't insure against. And that is why if we want our citizens, be it them in the precariat or proficients or any other group, to have security, we have to move in the direction of a basic income. But I leave that aside. Maybe Philippe will deal with that later. The third aspect, which for me is the most crucial aspect of being in the precariat, and all of you may experience this, is that it has distinctive relations with the state. If you're in the precariat, you have this feeling that you are a denizen, not a citizen. You are losing rights of citizenship. You are losing social rights, cultural rights, economic rights. And for me, the most important feature of the precariat is the following. You feel like a supplicant. You feel, and this is the etymological meaning of precarious from the Latin, to obtain by prayer. You have to ask. You have to ask bureaucrats, employers, parents, partners, somebody, help. You have to do that. And this is, of course, an undignified way of forcing people to live. But millions of people now feel like supplicants. They feel like denizens. They are losing rights. They know that. And we are seeing, with migration and other phenomenon, more and more people losing the rights that we think we all possess. But we don't. So this the combination of circumstances leads to the political dilemma. Because those in the precariat have a sense of relative deprivation. In my second book on the precariat, called The Precariat Charter, I divide the precariat into three groups. On page one of my original book, The Precariat, I had said, unless politicians and all of us understand the precariat, we are going to see the emergence of a political monster. That book was written in 2011, page one. You will not be surprised that in November 2016, I received a deluge of emails from around the world saying, your monster has arrived. And his name is Trump, as you could all have guessed. But that part is very reminiscent of my argument that the precariat is a class in the making consisting of three groups. The first group I call the atavists, 
because they have a sense of relative deprivation that they've lost a past. They've lost what their, their peers or their parents had, a laborist system of security. They've lost that. And it's this group who is relatively uneducated that supports the charlatans, the Trumps, the Boris Johnsons, the Brexit, and the, the right-wing neo-fascists around Europe. This group is mobilized. The second group is what I call the nostalgics. They haven't as home anywhere. They're the migrants, the minorities, the disabled. They're losing rights, they're part of the precariat, but they don't join the neo-fascist movements, but they're dropping out of our political system altogether. We have a disenfranchised, multi-million number of people in Europe in those circumstances. And the third group, and I hope in this room, some of you will belong to the third group because you, if you are in this group, are going to define our progressive future. That I call the progressives. These are the people who are going, sent to college and university to get a degree, and their parents and their teachers said, go to university and you will have a future. You will have a career. You will have status. And they come out of university and they don't have a future. And they don't have anything other than debt. And the probability of joining the precariat or hoping to join an organization like SMART that will stop them falling into the lower rungs of the precariat. This group is looking today for a new politics of paradise, a new enlightenment. And they are the people who are going to demand changes and the group that all of us should be supporting and belonging to. Because they aren't trapped in the old ideology of laborism. They don't want full time boring jobs for 30 years and that famous watch. They don't want that, and quite right too. They want a freedom and a sense of liberation which can enable them to have what we call Republican freedom. The freedom from domination by unaccountable figures of authority. That's real freedom. And for me, this progressive part is growing. And we, as citizens, and if we are aware of the crisis, must be encouraging. And when I got the invitation to come here this morning, and I can see my time is up, when I got the invitation, I said, I must accept because you are the sort of organization that are part of the vanguard for change. You are looking for a revival of the ethos of craft, the revival of the old occupational guilds, the professional guilds, and a revival of the ethics of solidarity. You must keep going, because the record of cooperatives in history is not good in terms of surviving. You must create mechanisms that the strength you have in day to day continues and builds. Because what we need is to mobilize more and more people who are in the precariat to realize they must join such organizations as yours. And for that reason, I wish you strength, more strength, and ultimately millions of members. Thank you very much. Uh, in order not to be too late on our time, we might take one or two questions if you have them briefly, and then we'll have to go to the next panel. Est-ce qu'il y a des questions dans la salle très rapide? 
Ah, pardon. Est-ce qu'il y a un micro baladeur quelque part Ah, can we find your book at the library Yes, euh, des anciens, oui. Le micro arrive. Bonjour, je vais parler en français parce qu'en anglais j'aurais du mal à être précise. Merci pour votre présentation. Euh, Branko Milanovic a sorti il y a quelques mois un livre sur les inégalités mondiales euh, avec une préface de Thomas Pigetti. Et dans ce livre, il montrait notamment la fameuse courbe en éléphant qui montrait qu'il y avait deux gros bénéficiaires ou gagnants de la mondialisation qui étaient les plus trois quatre mondiaux dont vous avez parlé, mais aussi les classes moyennes émergentes de ce qu'on appelait avant le tiers-monde, qui maintenant est, on va dire, le monde en dehors de l'OCDE. Et je voulais savoir comment vous intégriez cette transformation énorme du monde et le fait peut-être qu'on est maintenant tous citoyens du même monde et non plus nous simplement citoyens de l'OCDE dans votre analyse. I'm not sure if I, I, I fully followed you, but um, is this working? Yes. I'm not sure if I fully followed you, but uh, I think outside the OECD, uh, the growth of the precariat is even greater than the growth in, in Europe and the OECD. And I think the phenomenon of the anger of the precariat is actually greatest in China at the moment. It really is a, 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 a global phenomenon. I think the pressures that we're getting in Europe are part of the biggest problem because we're, we're being pushed backwards. But, but in, in a sense, it's a global thing. Well, thank you very much. As we're going to be running late on time, I'm going to ask if perhaps if you have any questions, I think that you're going to be here for a little time more. Um, you can ask directly to Guy Standing, because um, uh, we have to be. And I thank you very much for this encouraging. I was scared it was going to be depressing, but it was encouraging. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>